for members of our board of trustees that are part of the judging panel remotely from Fairfax County, uh, Brian Hill, uh, Greg Connors here in, uh, in Olin uh, 310, uh, who's our board chair, uh, Charlie Joyce and Sherry Walton, and Chris, sorry, and Chris Heckel, and then also a big supporter of our leadership program and our student affairs team, uh, Sherry Walton. Uh, Sherry generously sponsors the $10,000 annual prize for the best team. 5,000 will go to the top team. Uh, 5,000 will go to the university to implement their idea. And a returning judge from the Rochester area, Yasmin Maddox, who was complaining about the weather there last week. And <laughs> we had to tell her it's always beautiful and sunny here. And by contrast, in Alfred, it is as it is here today on a great spring day. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my co-instructor, Gabby Gausted. Uh, thank you all for joining. We look forward to seeing what our student teams have to um, present today. Thanks, Mark. Yep. Thanks so much to everybody tuning in today. We're really excited for all of our student presentations. Uh, LEAD 300 is actually an, an elective for our leadership minor. Um, so we're really uh, excited to both support that program and to lead this class. So um, I'm not biased at all, even though I'm decked out <laughs> in the gear from this team. It happens to be one of the teams that I was mentoring. but. I'm going to let them go ahead and introduce themselves, but this is the Fiat Festival team. Okay. I'm going to Dan time you guys for 12 minutes for the presentation. Thank you. And then we'll go to eight minutes of Q&A. So we'll go whenever you're ready. Yeah, thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity. Um, before we begin, we just wanted to go ahead and introduce ourselves. So I'm Lucas Perry. I'm a sophomore in our Art Design and Business Administration programs, and I'm from Naples, New York. Um, my name's Riley Schreer. I'm a junior health planning and management major, and I'm double minoring in leadership and economics. I'm Kiana. I'm majoring in political science, minoring in business administration and economics, and I'm a junior here from Long Island. My name is Allison O'Toole. I'm a junior business administration major with a minor in sports management and leadership, and I'm from Simi Valley, California. Before we really jump into the idea, we wanted to go through with you guys the main issues we saw surrounding Alfred that we're trying to tackle um, with improving the university. There we go. <laughs> so for our main challenges, we were looking at the lack of branding. We wanted to create value for the Alfred name and make the recognition wider than the circle that it has right now. Beyond that, we're also looking at the lack of community co coordination. We're trying to take advantage of those missing uh, collaboration opportunities, as well as look at economies of scale where we're putting in um, more, uh, <laughs> we're putting in more in the beginning to lessen our costs as we go. Then we have our lack of activities. We are looking at student isolation and retention as well. So to talk about those, I have Allison over here. So like you mentioned with uh, the challenges with lack of activity and student retention going to student isolation, here we have a chart that shows the three primary reasons on why people left Alfred University. And um, the two that uh, we're highlighting here are the most controllable from Alfred, which is the lack of social connections and not enough to do slash board. With the lack of social connections, it came out to 15% of students. That's why they left. And then uh, nothing to do slash board came to 25%. So what are we really proposing to you all today? We're proposing Fiat Festival, a celebration of the art and history of Alfred, engaging students, alumni, faculty, and the outside community. With a four day long celebration of all of the arts here, we have um, this whole celebration put together and scheduled to show you that would really honor everything that makes Alfred as special as it is. In the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see our Festival logo, which you also have all received at stickers and on your masks as well. Additionally, I have here in the bottom right-hand corner, the Horizons Holding the Sky logo. With each year of the festival, we plan on having um, a student-run theme contest 
to really find a theme that encompasses all of Alfred. Um, Alfred being here on Canacadia Creek, uh, we wanted to look at the word horizons or Canacadia in the Seneca language that literally translates to holding the sky, thinking of this whole festival as a new horizon and a new chapter for Alfred University. Next, we'll turn to Kiana, who is going to explain some of the activities we have planned. So this is going to be a four day event starting the third Thursday of September, which is when our galleries open on campus. So on Thursday, we're going to have our soft opening and that's going to focus on the art. And we're going to open up the museums. There's going to be an art walk. We've spoken with John Minos in the town and he's willing to give discounts to anyone who comes to campus for the weekend. Friday is going to be a student focused day and we figured we should do something to get students who aren't interested in art involved as well. So we're going to have a dance, long games, perhaps a fireworks show. On Saturday is when we really include the village of Alfred. We've already spoken to them and they're willing to let us close down Main Street where we'll have student vendors as well as alumni vendors, um, a chalk walk, food and games. And then Saturday night, we want to celebrate Alfred's motto, Fiat Lux, let there be light. And to do that, we're going to have a neon workshop outside and light up the night sky. On Sunday, we're going to bring it back to campus. We're going to put up booths along Academic Alley. We're also going to have activities like make your own pizza, live music, as well as the things that go on in the village on Sunday in the basement in the farmer's market. Now I'll turn it back over to Riley. All right. So you might be wondering what we're going to get back out of this, why we're really doing it. Um, so we've got four R's laid out for you for our return on investment. That's recognition, reconnect, revenue, and retention. Um, so for recognition, we're hoping that this festival can really promote the uniqueness that we have here in Alfred um, by showing off all the different parts of our facilities. So we'll have art. Um, as we just mentioned, the Make Your Own Pizza, that's going to bring in the ceramic engineering students. Um, business students are going to be able to help with the vendoring, uh, vending and sales. Um, and on Saturday, it's also family weekend that day. Um, admissions estimates that about 60 to 200 prospective student families come out that weekend. Um, so we'll be able to have recognition for them as well um, and really show them that we have stuff to offer whenever they come out to see what's going on out here. Um, for Reconnect, we're hoping that this brings alumni back to campus um, in a very engaged way. Um, and revenue, we are expecting a little bit of revenue from the festival. Um, we've done, or that's kind of just based on our crude estimations that we have so far. Um, so we'll be selling things like dance tickets, um, spots to vend on Main Street and Academic Alley, and we're planning to do like some hot dog day-esque shirt sales. Um, so we're thinking that the revenue from those things will reinvest into the festival for the next year and then also take a portion and donate it to the Alfred Village Emergency Services Department because of all the work that they're going to have to put in to help us make this happen. Um, and then there's also going to be revenue for the village. So this will bring in um, some tourist money. So they're going to be spending money at the local businesses, uh, lodging, things like that. Um, and then retention, as we spoke about with Allison, uh, really getting all the students involved. Um, I know in the spring we all have hot dog day that we look forward to, but it would be really fun to have something in the fall that we look forward to coming back to campus for um, and really just hitting off the fall semester with something like this so it can be fun for everybody. Um, and then if you look at the back of the brochures that we've passed out, there is a QR code for this website that we've created. Um, oh, it's in the middle, my bad. <laughs> Alright, so So this is the website that um, Kiana has created. Uh, it's Fiat Festival at Alfred University is our homepage. We have a little mission statement at the bottom um, talking about recognition of history, festival, weekend of celebrating the arts, um, and when it's held, and what you can do here. So up at the top, we have a banner. This banner just lists the days um, to these activities that's happening each day. We'll do Saturday as an example. Um, here we just have a banner of the ceramics. Department, and then we'll have a chalk walk. Um, so this just gives the location and time. Down here, we're planning to do some ceramic demonstrations as well, um, in the vein of what was it, Raku? Yeah. Raku extravagance. Raku extravagance. I'm not sure if you guys know what that was, but um, we're working with Wayne Higby to get that started back up. 
then we'll do some demonstrations in other arts departments as well. Oh, there it is. <laughs> okay. And then this will be the make your own pizza as well. Um, so the night of lights, we're expecting this to be a big event. Um, so we'll have neon works done by the neon department in the arts. Um, and it'll be on Academic Alley at sundown. Um, and then we're also planning to showcase the observatory that night. So having people come out and check out the planetarium. Here's a link for prospective students. Um, since a lot of this festival is about bringing in prospective students and en engaging families with students so that they can go back and tell their family friends that might have students looking for colleges, um, what exactly is going on here. So here they'll be able to sign up for campus tours, demonstrations, and even apply through the website. Um, and then this page is just gonna showcase the galleries. Um, these will be updated, you know, once it's actually happening, so we know what it'll feature that weekend. Um, and yeah, so it's just a list of the galleries. And then here's where you can get involved, sign up to um, bend, have a vending booth, um, have your work displayed in one of the galleries, and volunteer, so helping out as a student. And then I'll turn it back over to Lucas to close up. Share this Yes, but that, that really concludes our presentation now. So we'll open it up to questions. Oh, yes, and we, we <laughs> before we fully move into questions, we also want to thank our advisory board. So over the past semester, we've been working very closely um, with a member of Alfred University faculty and staff. So we wanted to thank uh, Caitlin Brown, who's been working <laughs> with us to really develop this project, our communications director for the School of Art and Design, the assistant dean of the School of Arts and Design, Dan Napolitano, the chief curator of the Strand Museum, Wayne Higby, um, Dr. Lisa Land from Performing Arts, as well as Gabby <laughs> for this past <laughs> semester. I forgot. And John Lewis, the director of the Student Activities Board, as well. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Great job. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of questions. One is housing. I don't know how many of you, you want to pull in um, prospective family students and their families and alum coming back. Are you going to have enough housing in this area? Yes. So with housing, we would have the Saxon Inn would be available and then there would be Economy Inn in town as well as Cornell would be opened up. There would have to be a little bit more of a, a discussion really to figure out um, numbers of how many people are coming. Um, admissions estimates that 60 to 200, and we can obviously put a cap on those as well, but that um, would come down to those places. There's also a lot of local Airbnbs that have started in town. Um, so yeah, so that's true. Well. I have one more quick question. The continuity on this. You've got to have a really solid committee going forward after you all leave. So, you know, that's something I Think would be quite important. You don't want to do this for three years and then have it fall apart. Yeah, so we're hoping that our work with um, student activities will be kind of the link in that chain to keep it going forward. Um, so we usually do have a lot of students on student activity board and John Lewis is very good at getting them engaged and um, getting new students to come like freshmen engaged so that those things can continue through their four years too. As well as the admissions ambassadors. So with partnering with Marie Bentley in admissions, we would have access to the tour guides as well for the Saturday and Sunday events. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yay. <clears throat> yeah, my one of two of my questions. One of them was the management sustainability. And when you say student activities, would you pass this on to them to then manage? How would that work? So right now the plan for like creating the festival is to have one student over the summer um, work off of APEC to like really get the planning down and solid and be at the alumni uh, reunion to market it there as well. Um, so I think kind of just finding that student every year um, will be the key to making that part of the plan. And so does the student activities board, do they have a budget that yeah. would allow someone to be committed or dedicated to the structure of this for sustainability purposes mm -hmm. yes and then also working through apex um the okay. students will be able to do this as i think you're saying like an internship yeah so the idea would be if we are able to get the um, 
festival off the ground and really running, which we have it scheduled and worked with the town. It will be happening this fall. It would, Geo would be with the continued success. We would move it into an internship position instead of the APEX funding. Okay, so my, my second, well, go ahead. I think one of the most important things about this festival is that it's something students are interested in, something students will want to do and keep up. So I understand your concerns about how are we going to continue this, but we have to remember that it is an exciting opportunity for students. And so what would the cost be to the university? What's your, what's your white paper? What's your cost structure that you see for this event for the university, including like the student management and then any other peripheral costs for the university? Do you guys have any ideas of the structure as to what that would be? Yeah, so we, uh, <laughs> you can't, yeah, but we can just talk about it too. Um, so APEX already does, you know, university already funds that through things, so I'm not sure if that would count as an extra cost. Um, also, a lot of these things that we're planning, the university already has access to. Um, so like tents for um, vending and things, we have those for Hot Dog Day and for other events, and the town owns some as well, um, or the village, my bad. And Alfred State's going to be involved as well, hopefully. Um, so we're thinking of really spreading the cost between those three departments and using the things that we already have available. Um, so really relying on the resources that we have here. And then within our tuition at the school, the student tuition, uh, the student activities board receives funding each semester. And so we work with John Lewis to take a portion of that funding to keep the festival running as well. I don't think I asked my question properly. Do you have a budget set for what this event would cost. You guys could pull up the Excel, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it's a little bit of crude estimation. Um, I don't think it's linked on there. <laughs> yeah, on there. We can go through my OneDrive, so it's weird. Okay, do you want to pull it up then? Sure. Um, yeah, so it's definitely not like set numbers yet, but we did do a couple of estimations on what kind of prices we're going to be looking at. What's the overall cost? The overall budget, approximately. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head. We were focusing more for return on investment of like um, not numbers necessarily, but more things that the university will get out of it. Okay. <laughs> it's it's cost neutral. Yeah. The the revenue balances out the cost. They have they have a spreadsheet, but I don't know. It's really hard to pull it off. But it's going to be a whole thing. All right. All right. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah. Tia. Okay, no, I was going to say, um, great presentation, a couple of questions. One, it seems like it would be a natural fit since you're focusing on the arts to have some kind of mental health and wellness component, especially since there's been an uptick in mental illness among the college population, not only, you know, not next year, but nationally. So what, if any, um, programming would, would really address those issues have you considered partnerships with other regional colleges and universities with respect to wellness programming? And I guess the second question would be, I like the fact that you mentioned that this being a fall event would be a great complement to spring's hot dog day and spring family weekend. What, if any, planning or consideration has gone uh, in place regarding the bringing together prospective students and alumni in the area of family? it would seem as if it would be a good opportunity to, you know, give some street cred, so to speak, as to yes, Alfred's a great place, and also to um, really have a pipeline for internships and job opportunities, right? Because people are not only looking at Alfred for the education, but what will come after. So what, if any, considerations have you made for, for those two areas? So we're hoping that by reaching out to alumni, um, they will take it as the opportunity to come back um, and engage with students through that. So they would be able to talk to students about their time here, um, where they've gone from there, and things like that. And then the internship opportunity over the summer would be a great compliment to our um, art and design and business administration double major that we offer. Um, so this would really give the students a chance to find out really about more of the business side of the art that would come with it. And beyond that, we have access um, with Caitlin Brown, the director of communications, we've been working um, to be able to reach out to every alumni directly. So we would have, we have already set the list within 20 miles of our alumni. 
50 miles, 200, or all our alumni in general. So we have that list that we can readily, whenever we are ready to go ahead. Um, the plan is to reach out to them. Uh, I believe you said July was going to be the month we reach out to alumni. So they would be invited back to com uh, campus. And then over the summer, I will be going to the alumni um, day as well. Um, and we haven't considered the wellness programming, but that's a really good idea. We'll take note of that. <laughs> Can I one more? Yep. Um, so I, you listed three challenges, and I feel like your presentation and idea adjust, address the challenge of student isolation and retention. But I didn't really pick up the challenge around branding, and I also didn't pick up any links to the history of Alfred in your plan. Can you comment on those, please? Yes. Yeah, so with branding, the whole idea would be that by having students return or prospective students come to campus, having alumni return and really creating this recognition with the festival, there would be a brand for Alfred outside of the cube. So we think of Alfred a lot of times as a bubble and we're looking to really take that bubble and pop it. How do we make Alfred available to the outside world? Uh, when we think about like art and design here, especially in New York State, the first place you think of is New York City or Buffalo or Corning. But there's no reason why we can't have Alfred on that list. So we want to establish the brand and the recognition of Alfred as the center of the arts right here in Alfred. And then in terms of the history, we would be partnering with the Forest People Club as well. So we would be doing hikes on the Seneca Trail, as well as tying it back in with Cantadilla and then um, some of the more um, indigenous ideas of life as well. We're also considering having some history tours on campus where we would talk about the history and uniqueness of Alfred University and our past alumni encounters. Thank you. So just one other. Um, we have an alum who's on the board who sent me a text from out on the West Coast. So he's up early to listen to your presentation. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> one of the questions he he offered to, for me to volunteer for him is, uh, do you view this as a competition or do you view this as diluting homecoming events, which occur in October, versus standing alone and having the ability of campus and the university to support both fall types of activities. Yeah. Um, that was another concern we had very early on was you put a festival in fall and a lot of people are gonna associate with it with homecoming and then also with hot dog day, we don't want this to be a hot dog day. It's not the same idea, but it is a fall festival. So we are trying to keep them separate from each other. So homecoming would still be able to have its own function um, with football and everything like that, whereas our event would run separate, focusing on engagement and the arts. Thanks. I'm gonna put comment. Um, when you go to set the date on this, take a close look at what's going around in the uh, communities around it, because Wellsville does the big bridge run and walk. Plus, they do the artisan tours, and a lot of them are probably Alfred alums. So there's there's going to be those types of things going on. I don't think you want it to conflict with them, but you may want to help complement. Maybe they can complement you too, because they bring a lot of people, especially the bridge. Yeah, I was going to suggest that too. But, then, but yeah, I think you're early enough to where you're going to beat those guys out of the box. But but the experience they have, is like that, like the wellness groups and things like that, that that are plugged into Ridgewalk for one thing, maybe something that you could tell a little bit on their learning. So maybe yes. if you need any help to contact those organizers. That's great. Thank you. Arrange that for you. This is team one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. 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 Well, during the winter, I kept looking at the weather back home. I'm like, it's 80 degrees and it's 20 here. Don't torture yourself like that. <laughs> and one of our my sisters is also with us from California. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. I dragged her with me. That's great. I have one of her triple sisters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. She, yeah, there's a ton of money on the softball team. Softball team. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. In California, like a, maybe a half a dozen really good players, too. Yeah. Yeah, they're fantastic. You guys, how do you have your presentation? All right. Cool spot.
Okay. We might have to have you guys log in Hello, my name is Rachel Fleischman, and I am a freshman this year at Alfred University. Um, I am an out-of-state student. I was born and raised in Ohio. Um, being from Ohio, I had never heard of Alfred University. It's a very small school. However, I actually knew, my family knew an alumni from AU, and it was through them that I first heard of the university. And by listening to them talk about their experience when they were here at AU, that's what motivated me to apply to come here to Alfred. Once I applied, my admissions counselor was also an alumni from Alfred University. Throughout my senior year, this alumni and admissions counselor would call me frequently to answer any questions that I had about the campus and to tell me how AU helped her get to where she was today. This whole interaction felt very personalized and none of the other schools did this for me and that's ultimately why I decided to come here to Alfred. Due to my experience with these alumni, I wanted to find out what other alumni Alfred University has. So I went to the AU homepage. At this time, I would like to ask you to take out your electronic devices, go to the AU homepage and try to find the list of Alfred alumni. I have <laughs> How can I not find Charlie and Sherry's name? <laughs> Has anyone been able to find Charlie's it yet? Oh, okay. <laughs> Good point, Sherry. So you found it? No. I bet you won't find it <laughs> because I certainly didn't. And if I couldn't find it, then that also means that prospective students and current students probably aren't able to find it. In fact, it took our group until two weeks ago to finally find where that list of alumni are. Being able to not find the list of alumni is a shame because we have very notable alumni, such as Mimi Hattie. She studied marketing and economics, and she is now the senior director of program management at HCL Technologies in Manhattan. Other notable alumni are Patrick Baines, who is now the CEO of NerdWise, um, which is a sales and marketing solutions company. And finally, we have alumni such as Stephen Hahn, who is president and CEO of Woodsboro Bank. All right, so we did some research at other colleges to see where their alumni were. And as you can see at Kenyon College, they have it on the top right after Kenyon where you can find their notable alumni. Baldwin Wallace, you can clearly see at the top, there's an alumni tab and it takes you to their alumni page, which shows you their notable alumni. And then we have St. Lawrence University in the top right, their alumni tab, take you to alumni, and explains all about their alumni. So for our project, we want to have videos of alumni to put them on the Alfred University page to make it easier for students, alumni, and current students to find. 
So what we want to do is not only on the alumni tab, but under the academics tab, we want to put the alumni videos with their respective majors, explaining their major and why um, they chose Alfred and how they are today, what they're doing today. So our target group would be the prospective students. We want these students to see the alumni, know why the alumni did their major. If a student sees like, oh, I wanna do that major, that alumni is doing this today and they're successful, I could do that too. Current students, we want our current students to get connected with our alumni as well. And then we want alumni to connect with other alumni. So for our video criteria, um, we're gonna have like, like um, Amber said, have um, uh, videos that alumni make. Um, we want them to explain their accomplishments, like what they're doing today, um, to give um, all the target groups um, an idea of what they're doing. Um, what they did at AU um, to show like what um, like groups, athletics, um, major, stuff like that, um, how AU propelled them, and contact information so that any of um, people who want to ask questions like about any of these experiences they had at AU can ask them maybe like an email or any other um, social media that they want to share. And the video should be, um, we're hoping to be around 90 to 120 seconds. Um, enough time to answer all the questions that we want in our um, criteria, but short enough that it's not like too long to watch. Um, some example of alumni video. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, the first one is Katie Park. She grad graduated in, in 2001. That's like a more of like a social media kind of style, um, which because like most people have social media, so that's like one way they can do it. Um, another example is Jason, and he graduated in um, '97 and '99. Um, the next video is from Stephen, and he graduated in 81.
So as far as the cost of our project, this isn't a very expensive thing to implement since we already have the faculty and staff and technology to produce these videos. So we would like to see the money be used to promote Apex. So really involving our students uh, on the, in the process of creating these videos, updating alumni profiles, and really giving them meaningful experiences that they can take with them after they leave our university. There are many benefits of this project, one in which that it enhances student perspective yield so when students are looking for colleges to attend to, they often look for notable alumni that graduated under the major or degree that they're intending on studying. We believe that by making the experience more personalized and having more information for them, that it can just be very meaningful to them and get more students here. We also believe that, that it can increase student retention, which has been an issue that our college has really been looking into recently. And we believe that by making sure that our current students really can be confident in the education that they're gaining at our institution and really believing that their degree can lead them to success is very important. Connecting students with alumni is also a wonderful benefit of our project because it allows for internship opportunities, job opportunities, and also kind of opens the door for possible mentorship opportunities while they're in college. So they get to ask questions of, hey, how does this major apply to this job that I could go into? So it really just allows students to get more information uh, for when they leave. Connecting alumni with each other is one thing that is really important because we really want to strengthen our alumni network. The more that our alumni can be involved with the, each other and our current students, the more successful we believe that we can be. Internship opportunities in our college for current students is also a benefit. So that goes back to the APEX situation where we're really trying to involve our current students in reaching prospective students, and then also involving alumni in that project. So it's kind of like a full circle idea that we're really hoping to achieve. And then lastly, a benefit is that's overseen by the marketing and communications department, which really creates that sustainability that we're looking for. Um, after we graduate and after we leave the institution, we want this idea to continue to go, continue to develop. So we believe that uh, because it's overseen by a department, that this can continue to be led by both students and faculty. We see many extensions beyond this project too. So uh, as we saw Kizzy Parks video, that's more of a social media, TikTok or Instagram-esque uh, video to be pushed out to people. So we see many opportunities to create different videos to reach different people in different ways. Um, and we plan on using data analytics uh, with help of Jonathan Kent to really figure out which videos are most beneficial in getting students attention, bringing them here, or even just having them apply. And then once we find out that information, we can figure out which video should we produce more of, which should we not, and what platform is most beneficial when reaching our audience. And lastly, we want to use email to our benefit and as an extension because when we see students are applying, we want to send them an email with rather a video or a message from an alumni, just to again, create that personal experience and to really make it meaningful and get people here. When you have a one-on-one -on -one interaction or even have an interaction with an alumni or faculty, it's harder to say no to, for them to come here than if you never had an interaction with someone from a different institution. So that's kind of where we're going with this project. So, Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. And we are open to any questions that you may have. I have one, your data analytics. In fact, I had just, you answered the question, but I want to hear a little bit more about that. You're going to be tracking the connections that are being made and the satisfaction of that and how we want to you know, state it. How often would you be doing this and how often will you be updating and including the alums that you're going to be highlighting? So we try to do that as often as possible just to try to keep up with the time. So I, I would think that it'd be a really good idea to do it before and after um, students apply. So once we figure out how many people have actually committed to our college, maybe go back and see, uh, did they like this video? Did they interact with this alumni 
what platform were they on? Maybe sending out a survey to each student to say, hey, how did you find out about us? Tell us a little bit more about your experience. So that's kind of what I'm thinking as, as much as possible, just so we can uh, stay as current as possible. Uh, oh. Brian has a question, actually. Yeah. Um, can you hear us, Brian? Can, can he unmute himself? I just asked Mark. I, I can hear you. Um, first off, a great presentation. Uh, you guys picked the wrong alumni that are influential in the college and the university. I just want to let you guys know that. Um, <laughs> second question um, was about data analytics. So I'm going to leave that one alone. My, my, my question is, how have you, uh, what, are, what is your plan on getting the other colleges involved with this? Because I look at a lot of computer science um, and technology and social media and I don't like emails because I get like 3,000 a day. Social media is the way it's going. So how are you going to blend or how are you proposing to blend the older people like myself and the younger generation in understanding how we can move forward with the alumni database? So like we said, um, one of the platforms that we want to put these videos on is the website. So we would like to promote it like that, even on the homepage, if we have maybe an ad or something that says, hey, check out our alumni videos, just so people who maybe aren't so into social media or get spam emails and the email gets lost, they can see it like that. But again, the, the, the question is, how are you going to help promote the university? So I get what you just said, but are you also going to try and think about other social media aspects like Snapchat? for the younger generation who are alumni vis-a-vis -vis the older generation who would look at the website. So I'm trying to get you guys to think a little bit broader, but this is a great presentation. I think it's something that we can do and the data analytics is going to be awesome. We can figure that out. Thank um, you. The university actually currently has um, a TikTok account, an Instagram, several Instagram accounts. So we could already use those to launch um, our videos. They're already available to us. So in terms of the logistics, um, where do you see, is there a marketing club here on campus? Like, is there like within student so, activities yes. or marketing club? So how do you see the sustainability of, of a student run management of this program? Because you talk about the cost being de minimis. Um, I think what Brian is talking about, and one of the things I'm thinking of is how do we manage this, the, the, the collections of these videos and then posting them onto the website or onto the social media platforms. There's, there is time that's involved and time is money. So have you been able to identify or do you have an estimation as to what that time would take? And is it something that you would, you would submit would go onto the marketing club or you indicated in your presentation that it would go into the marketing communications department to be managed? Well, they would need to have somebody in their department, whether it be a student intern or whatever it may be, in order to assimilate and do all these things. Have you guys identified a budget um, and that that sustainability over time? Um, so we, throughout the development of this uh, project, have been in contact with the marketing and communications department. And we have decided that um, to implement this, they would oversee it because they already like our idea and things are in the process and they want to make this happen. And they want to do either internships or the APEX program or a work study program that would employ students to help out, such as reaching out to alumni, et cetera. But it would overall be overseen by the marketing and communications department to ensure that after students graduate, this project will continue um, and continue to be updated. And then the other question, or the other point, I think, or just suggestion as you're contemplating this is one of the things that Brian touched on is, which is funny, but it's, it's I take it very seriously in terms of marketing and promotion. People who are really good at what they do oftentimes don't like to talk about themselves. They want, it's not that they'll shy away from it, but I'm not going to walk around saying I'm the best person at my job and I'm the most notable Alfred alone in my generation but their friends or other people within the university would then highlight them. How would you go about identifying people who should be highlighted? Those who want to be highlighted, I would think you don't want on the website. 
So how do you think about, how do you identify the alums who should be highlighted versus those we don't want to be highlighted? So we mentioned like getting a hold of uh, the head, the deans of the different departments of our college and saying, what do you recommend? Who would you recommend for these videos? Then we would reach out to them. And if they were willing to do it, then we would further pursue that. If not, then we would just try to find another option. And what we're trying to do in these videos is try and we don't want them to necessarily like say I'm the best or this. We just want to make it more student driven, student focused, instead of like, I'm amazing. We want, how can I help you? <laughs> Additionally, the CDC keeps track of um, all the alumni and they do their best to keep track of where they end up going after they leave AU. So um, we would do a partnership easily with the CDC to get the names of those alumni. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. I think the logistics of it, as I'm sitting back here and some of the business background in terms of trying to work some of these things, logistically, it's a great, I love the idea, the logistics part of it um, and the management on it, I think it, uh, it was gonna be more time consuming and have more of a cost than you might be anticipating. Um, Brian mentions that he can't hear the questions that we ask. So if you don't mind trying to restate the question as you hear it. Oh. And so my question is, uh, you actually have multiple audiences that you're going after. So how do you plan to target each, you know, alumni is different from students, is different from families perhaps. So can you restate that and then what do you think? Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, the question is, it, you, you have different audiences for these videos. How do you plan to target, but you also mentioned that uh, with the criteria that you're, and with the data analytics that you're gonna find like single criteria, but you have different audiences. So students may want something different than alumni may, alumni right. may want. So the question is, how will you target the different audiences with uh, same video? So first, okay. restate the question. <laughs> um, so the question is, how are we going to, because we have multiple audiences, such as the alumni, students, prospective students, how are we going to target these different audiences? Um, with the students, we wanted to target them more of the social media route. Um, with the videos talking about how can we help you, um, why would AU be good for you? Um, in terms of the alumni, uh, we've thought about different incentives to try to get them to want to help us out. Um, we've thought about maybe uh, making a competition in the sense that whoever's video gets the most clicks or uh, is shared the most will receive like a swag, like a gift package type thing. Um, just so it's like, oh, if I do this video and it does well, I could get some free AU uh, swag. So that's how we kind of thought about making it fun for everybody and getting everybody involved into it. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Well, I'll find out if it's actually a question once it comes out of my mouth. But I was just saying, <laughs> as for our comments, I think it was a, a great presentation. I know. Um, when I, many, many, many years ago, was looking at Alfred University, um, I did actually look at alumni, and I had to do a lot of digging, and my mother, who's a, a better um, researcher in many respects than I am, did so as well. I say that to say, and my view is a bit obstructed here, I recognize the young lady on the bottom left, um, I believe she was actually my year or the year before, um, I recognize a few people. But what I immediately focused in on is that 19th century picture. And I think if, if your team is selected, you would probably do well to really consider the history going all the way back to Alfred, especially at the point at which we find ourselves culturally, as a society, politically. Alfred has second to none history in terms of inclusion you know, access to opportunity. And I think that at least so far has not been highlighted. Um, and I know that for myself, that was one of the things that really was like, I, I feel good about my decision. 
Um, so I'd say that, and as a couple of other people have mentioned, your costs, um, even though we can't see the breakdown here, being a part of the APEX program is, is fine and wonderful, but, but as, a, as a, a tech entrepreneur uh, with a startup, I can tell you, and especially regarding um, you know, customer segmentation, the cost for advertising so that you actually get noticed are astronomical. And so if you're not considering the, the ad spend, pretty much it's gonna be like you know the saying about does it, it, when a tree falls in the woods, if nobody hears it, it really fall or whatever. Um, so I would say, again, if, if you're selected, really dig deep on ad spend because that will destroy the entire thing if it's not careful and um, budgeted. Thank you. Thank you. That's our team two. So thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Edgar, Edgar, you can introduce yourselves and where you're from. Uh, my name is Amber O'Toole. I'm a junior and I'm from Simi Valley, California. Wait, are you the sister of the... Yes, I am. Uh, I knew she looked familiar. <laughs> I'm Isaac Little. I'm a freshman and I'm from Alfred, New York. Right down the road. Yeah. Um, my name is Ivy Valley. Um, I'm a sophomore and I'm from Lancaster, New York. My name is Rachel Fleischman. I am a freshman and I'm from Eastport, Ohio. Great, thanks. the last two years but I think the last time I saw you was two years ago right around the same time yeah they, well, <laughs> the last year I'm thinking of, um <laughs> yeah, all things considered they've been phenomenal have it yeah Great. stressful but but good is, good so is it good yeah I know yeah. it's last year's been no. I've been a sink or swim type of circumstance it actually we were actually aided were by you? what Great. Um, so that's yeah. great. Yeah. Good for you. Thanks. Way to be well positioned. I'm sorry. Way to be well positioned. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, yeah. I'll tell you more about it yeah. later. I have to apologize to Brian on the uh, on the call. The last video, the testimonial, the audio didn't come through. I apologize about that. Uh, Sorry, right. he'll just take care of you when he sees you at the next meeting. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I hope everyone's doing good on this sunny Wednesday. My name is Ethan Kozo. I'm a finance major uh, in the year 2023. I'm Zach Jabot. I'm a marketing major and I graduate next month, 2021. My name is Amari Sandoval. I'm a marketing finance major. I also graduate next month. And my name is Matthew Wedzik. I'm a business administration major and I'm a 2023 as well. And our group is uh, investing in your future. Um, we're going to be discussing the various aspects of taking our class, uh, as well as how we think it can improve out the university. Are we remote or are we hitting? Yeah, you, unfortunately, you got to advance it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just click on the on your presentation. I'm sorry. There you go. Okay. Yeah, I can stay back here. Okay. Uh, so, Investing in Your Future is a new class at Alfred University. Um, it's a class that teaches public speaking, personal finance, and other uh, basic life skills. We feel that there are classes out there at Alfred University that cover some of these topics, but not one class that covers every single one of these topics. And we feel that uh, college, college graduates at 
any university, but especially here at Alfred, could use uh, these skills. So benefits of investing in your future. Um, we help first generation students, uh, especially, but um, we promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. We give students the confidence to go into the real world and start real life. And in that they will learn essential skills, not typically taught in the classroom. Yeah. We also find it extremely important that we put an emphasis on first generation students as there are a lot of those here at Alfred University. Um, the life skills that we're gonna be discussing are the secrets to like managing wealth, especially building wealth since our biggest asset right now is our time. Um, so we have a couple examples and the first example of a similar course is High Point University. Um, although it's not like a normal course, it's a seminar and the seminar for the president, he really goes into more of more of skills that he's gone through, he's used in the real world, in the realms that he's been through, but also he has some type of curriculum because it is a three day seminar, I believe, like a three day of the week seminar, and they go into that really detail. Boston University is another example. Um, they basically have multiple courses for multiple times of the year, whenever you want to. First year, it's the one that they really emphasize on, which is the one that they say that they really try to um, uh, appeal to the first year. But also, they have a senior course, which is towards the end of your you know, um, university career. But also, they have four courses, which is career development, health, wellness, academic success, and financial literacy, which you can take at any point of your college career. Um, these are the top, well, the 11 top skills that employers look for for job candidates. And this is from indeed.com, which I be we believe was very important because it's a very credible source of, you know, getting jobs and stuff. So their opinion, you know, really has a lot of weight to it. And we wanted to show all the 11 because most people have a few of these skills and people work to getting these skills. But if you know what type of skills employers are looking for beforehand, that can really change the way you get your next job. Yeah, going off that and what employers look for, we try to implement a lot of that stuff into the class. So first and foremost, we have public speaking, investing in finances. This will also include like basic money skills like saving, like uh, writing checkbooks and things like that. Um, and leadership and team building, that's a very important skill as well, obviously. Yeah. And we're going to have, yeah. Uh, the leadership part is really important to our group as well because we didn't want to call it career development. We want to call it leadership because we believe that going into your career, you should be the leader of your career rather than trying to. I mean, of course, we're going to have to go through some interviews, but we want to lead our career. So we want to work on team building and leadership rather than career development and interviewing skills. <laughs> Um, so our class will be taken by, again, first year students, first generation students, usually because, you know, underprivileged students uh, back at home, their parents won't either either have time or the resources to talk to them about certain things. So getting first year students either back to that type of literacy or get them some type of knowledge because they probably didn't have it before or that they didn't know how to do certain things. This is just to get them on the right step and investing in their future. And also all students, make, like all majors can do this class. Like it's available to everyone. And uh, there was a study by the University of Washington that re revealed that uh, graduates were equipped for their job, even like even after they got a job, but what they really struggled with was the basic life skills, such as money management or like effective communication. And that's that was what they found and concluded in the study. It should also be um, said that I, I don't have the study now, but over 10 million people between the ages of 21 and 34 don't even have a bank account set up. So that could only reflect worse on their children. Um, and then our class will be a three credit elective class. Um, we plan on starting it out like that, but we hope that at some point it could become part of the first year experience here at Alfred University. As you've seen, Boston University had multiple different courses, which would take up 
um, a lot of credits in the student time. So we hope that maybe uh, you come into Alfred, you take this class, you learn all these skills, and hopefully, um, it'll go good. We also printed out some certificates for all you guys. Yeah, so. I mean, thank you. Yeah, I guess so, because I don't know uh, everyone's name. <laughs> uh, is Brian Hill here? No, it's Brian Hill. Right we'll get him. <laughs> we'll get him. <laughs> finally, yeah. get, finally get a diploma from Alfred? Or? <laughs> <laughs> um, Catherine Barlow. Mm -hmm. yeah. We can also pass them around, maybe. So, yeah, yeah, we yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is, we're going to be talking about our uh, class structure, and uh, so the three main things about the class structure are, would be engaging alumni, uh, promoting networking, and generating internships and jobs, uh, either through uh, the, the alumni that you connect with in the course, or if, since you have this and you'll be able to be able to apply this on a resume, it could help you to get a job that you might not have got before. Yeah, also in my first year experience here at Alfred University, I was actually with you, Mark. Um, I remember you talking about how we could engage alumni after school so that maybe they would come back and appreciate the school and work with students like people did in need, and also maybe um, give endowments for future students who need financial aid. And we think that this kind of class would definitely improve how people appreciate um, Alfred, because I know like as a finance major, every time I talk to an underclassman, their first question is about investing. And I can't tell them everything right then and there. So this class will definitely help out. Right, so here are some of the costs that we were thinking about would take to implement their class into the school. So it's a new elective class, so we would have to make some payments for that. And we would have to pay staff, like professors, to write the curriculum and make of that, obviously. Our class right now, we want it to become an elective class just to start it, but eventually we would want to have it as a required course or part of a required course for all first year students as they come in, or even like Boston University did with senior students or to you take it throughout your time here at Alfred University. Um, so we're gonna compare some uh, student retention rates. Uh, we wanted to look at both universities that have, the, really these were the only two uh, universities that we could find with these programs or similar programs that we were talking about. We looked for a long time and there was not many programs out there uh, like this. And you can see Boston University has 94% student retention, which is one of the best in the country. Uh, High Point University, which is a lot more similar to Alfred, uh, has an 81% student retention rate. And then you have Alfred at 73, but I still didn't want to, uh, this out for too much because the average private university retention rate is 65%. So we are above the, the average, but you can see that we can improve. We also project uh, on this point that our class will improve the retention rate of Alfred University by two to 3%. Um, it may seem like a small figure, but as we've shown here, uh, every student retained is worth about $20,000 a year. Um, so if we were to even include 2% of the 550 incoming freshmen that we get every year, you see, I can't, I, I can't, sorry. Um, if we were to include even 2% of them, that would come out to about $220,000 a year. And if it was a first year experience class and they stayed for the rest, it would come out to about 666,000 over there. And this would be if, if it becomes implemented as a a requirement for all students because it, we feel like you would engage them more and they would value their their degree more so they would want to to stay um, and then we're just going to review just the, what the benefits for Alfred University would be so it would set Alfred above other schools in terms of graduate success so like I said before in that study by the University of Washington they said that whatever they, they're ready for their jobs, but they're not ready for real life when they graduate. So that's going to help a lot. Um, an additional admissions advertising point. So you can say that Alfred University is one of the only colleges or universities that offers a course like this and it'd be, be almost completely unique to Alfred University, which I think is a great thing. 
Yeah, um, with with the way technology is going and the way, I guess, the investing boom that's happening now in the last six months with people joining things like Robinhood and Coinbase and really getting into investing, but also having having a, a I guess, a role in the country's economy. People like to make money, but as well as have control on what they take and what they do. So I feel like this class in a first year student will put them in the right path to think in the right way. And then the, uh, the third one is increasing alumni engagement. Uh, so like we said, we'd wanna have uh, people like Pat Segroy who we had already uh, contacted and he said that he would be more than willing to help out with this class and wants to be involved in it. And I think that we could find many other people, alumni that would be willing to help out or be a part of this class. We can do them for them. Uh, so student retention, I'm happy you say that because uh, student retention I think is our biggest driving factor due to the fact that like, like Amar, what'd you say? Oh, I literally oh sorry. Uh, <laughs> like Amar was saying, uh, FinTech has been growing exponentially, and we think that um, every student deserves to be able to capitalize on what they could do, since we're all looking for jobs, even like a minor job now could equate to a lot of money with the right skills. And the last one is just improving the bottom line, which is exactly what we talked about. If, if we increase the student retention, then we're going to be able to save Alfred a lot of money. So instead of our course costing money to create, we're hoping that it eventually saves Alfred University money and adds something unique to like the course curriculum here at Alfred. That was one of our main factors in choosing something like this. We wanted to bring something to Alfred University rather than using up resources right in the beginning and then dealing with it. Like we could have thrown a big party. <laughs> so then we just want to ask you guys if you have any questions or comments on our presentation. I have a question. Uh, you're going to be trying to address underprivileged and first generation students. Some of those people may feel like there's a stigma attached with taking a class like that. How will you overcome that? Um, well, when we're advertising to our fellow students, uh, we might not talk about how much of it's going to impact first generation students just so that there isn't any stigma placed with that or how um, we don't want people to think that they need to take the class because they're lacking any life skills. We just want it to be known that we're going to be able to provide them questions that they may have. Yeah, that it's available. So we're not going to, that's not going to be an advertising point for our class. We just wanted to make the point to you guys that that is one of the biggest benefits that we think is going to come from our class. So how will you pitch the class to incoming students? Um, well, our, our main advertising point is going to be investing because that's where most of the um, questions that we get like as students come from. Uh, people here that aren't business majors are really uh, always asking questions about how they could market stuff or how they invest themselves, especially like uh, most of my friends are, are kids here at Alfred. So they're always asking me like how I can help them invest. And every, every person that I've talked to about this idea has said like it's a great idea. And then kept suggesting things in that. So, yeah. Thank you. So, uh, <clears throat> question you talk about the cost of the program, the, of the class. What is the actual, do you guys have a proposed budget for what that cost would be? Um, well, no. I mean, there's, there's a, a budget in place for current FYE, like common ground and stuff. So, we would hope our, our main goal would be able to take over the FYE experience. Since the class would be able to Sorry, what is that? The FYE first year experience. Okay. So every single freshman takes a first year experience course that's part of their major right now. We would want to uh, add on to that. Right now it's one day a week um, and it just goes over the basic things in your major. But a lot of people, it's not like the most like uh, informative class. Like you don't learn that much and it's just like a generic basic class. But we want to add you get credit for that. You get one credit, but it's not a grade, no. And so you're proposing here a full-scale class for which a grade would be administered. First, we want an elective class that would, that would be a grade administered. But our eventual long-term goal is to have it as not an elective class that's not a grade, where you just get a certificate for passing, for passing it. 
So what incentive does that provide a student? Because I want to get an A. When I was here, I wanted to get an A. And I wanted to go on my transcript and I wanted my GPA to be as high as possible. So when I got done, I could ask, you know, Charlie Joyce for a job. So what incentive does, what incentive would the class provide just, you know, me coming in as a freshman? If it's not an elective class, you're saying? Well, I mean, if it's an elective class, it's, it's, I mean, it's, you choose to take it, which is a good thing. Yeah. Um, well, but, I, I feel like uh, the certificate is where the benefit comes in because yeah. the certificate will obviously have to be backed by Alfred University. So I guess the credit of Alfred University knowing what they're talking about and teaching life skills is where the, benefic the benefits come from. We've also looked into uh, working with some other outside people like, uh, let's say Indeed or like, let's say Pat Segroy his company could cert could be on the certificate and say, Segroy Financial certifies that you have skills in X, Y, and Z. Okay, so I guess I'm missing the potential benefit of a certificate. I've been in business for many years. Yeah. Certificates mean nothing to me. Um, your GPA gives me some indication of your capacity, intellectual capacities as well as commitment to get work done. Certificates mean nothing to me. It, and I don't mean to be disrespectful to the concept, but when I think of a certificate, I don't think of Alfred University. I think of another school that might be in this valley that they give certificates for attending their school, which okay. doesn't have the same, to me, prestige or image that Alfred has. Yeah, um, I love this concept. I think this concept is fantastic. I think it's scalable. Which when we're looking at a business in terms of cost and return on investment, scalability is where it's at. You can, you can, this, I see this as a very scalable model, um, which is why I was very curious about what the budget would be, because you're, the ROI of the university, as you pointed out, uh, can have tremendous impact, but you can, you can replicate it throughout as you've done with Common Core. Um, so I, I'm more curious as to why you go certificate versus let me take the class and let me get an A. That was just, we're completely open to not having a certificate and doing just the class. Like, that's just... It was just one of our ideas, so yeah, it's not I, set in stone. Am I? I'm just saying, am I missing something that that the current student population values that more so than getting an A or having? No, that? I don't think so. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, um, I believe if we take the course of the class, which is going to be basically like heavy on investing, I believe that's going to be an assignment because. One of the things that we'll do in class that we talked about is actual investing live, live investing and learning how to do it at home. And also things like projects could be implemented in the class that you take back and you can do like a project on a stock or um, investing into a specific company throughout the semester or throughout the class. Things like that, I believe, are going to be really helpful and useful for students, I believe, because of our generation. We, like you said, the grade means a lot, but I know a lot of students here that they'll, they'll like go into a class that they don't like and have an amazing time and say, this is the reason why I stayed in Alfred. So that alone, that incentive of bringing not just things that you're going to read a book and then forget the next year is something that you can literally implement going to your dorm that same day. And I also think it should be said that um, with our class, we're trying to teach students valuable things rather than giving them something to apply for jobs with. Um, not all the kids taking are going to be business students. So um, some of them won't be applying for like big corporate jobs where their GPA matters and things like that. Do you know what I'm saying? Look, I think this should be a required course. My son goes to school and does well, but every time he comes home, he says, Dad, this has nothing to do with life. Why do I have to take this? That, that's I'm never going to use it. That's the biggest point. That's that what everyone says. So I think it's fantastic. I, 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 I think it's great. I think every person that goes to college should have a course like this yeah. for four years, not just for one semester. Yes. Yeah. We 100%. We definitely agree with you. Yes. Got time for one more question? That's going to be a commentary also. You have bits and pieces of this on campus already to the Justin Leadership Center. Unfortunately, you had to be put on the shelf for a year because of COVID and other restrictions. But, um, and plus the focus was on, on women students, but it was not limited to women students. Plus there's another 
piece of the leadership center, which is an academy, which is accredited course. You also get a certificate, but you also it's recognized on the diploma. So there are these pieces here. You're going into more in depth, which I think is terrific, but they would have workshops, public speaking, um, finance and investment, leadership, team building, especially in the academy. So there is a wealth of information housed somewhere over there that you may be able to springboard from. Plus they do a lot, they get a lot of analytical data on feedback. And so you may want that would be perfect to get the ground yeah. for the class. Mm -hmm. And, and um, leadership center. <laughs> yeah. is, we are also hoping that we could get uh, John Ulrich in on it as because he teaches a personal finance class that I'm in right now, which is another reason that we thought this would be good because it's personal finance and wealth management, but over a whole semester and like very blurry and really the basics. So I, like we think we can get through the basics of like wealth management a little bit faster and then get into the part that actually helps you in the future. Thank you. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Watching. yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll we will not be streaming our recording during the very Hunger we'll, we'll, Games after. Right? Yeah, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll call Brian now so he can be loose. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Definitely. It'll be separate, yeah. <laughs> wondering as they were talking about that that we already had that through the judge and leadership center but i don't know how much given what their angle was on it they weren't even necessarily aware of it so almost like utilizing it or kind of morphing it to utilize what we already have in existence we're going to wait an extra mark to come back in and uh, the, 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 the academy part again was not just limited to females and we only took 10 or 12 a year but that didn't include all the other um what that those are the ones that were that was for credit and right we did special projects their senior projects and worked as teams and it benefited the university community. that was the criteria okay. all the workshops we would put on with all of this and it was open to the campus but then there was the issue with marketing it and People thinking it was just for women. Yeah. It wasn't. Interesting. Um, you know, it's, it's something maybe to build on. Yes. Yeah. The space is there. No, oh, definitely. Good point. Okay, great. We got our, our last, but certainly not least, <laughs> presentation. This is our uh, team that's looking at retention. I'll let them introduce themselves. Good morning. So for Leadership 300, Improving Alfred, our team has put together a pitch centered around improving student retention, persistence, and improving student experience at Alfred University using data. I'm Carl Huber. Bill Briggs. Ian King. Kamala Costa. So any great solution is a solution to a problem. And the problem that we've identified is that the university cannot make data-driven recommendations on persistence because adequate data doesn't exist. Now let me illustrate this a little bit. We take data on students before they arrive at Alpha University. Once students get to Alpha University, we stop looking at that data. The next time we ask students how their experience at Alpha University was, is in exit interviews. To make data-driven recommendations, we need data on students while they're at Alpha University. So the third uh, challenge we face is that we need a survey that is structured, that is uh, conducive to product, proactive intervention. Right now, we don't have any data that shows us students that are currently struggling at the university where we can intervene with them and help them with the challenges that may cause them to leave in the future. Uh, so we need to create a survey system that actually does that. And the key elements that we need to do for that survey is that it needs to integrate with our system so that faculty can make those correct decisions because they know what the survey is. And students, we just feel confident in the survey, both that it is confidential and that it actually cares about them rather than just being something we have to fill out which 
also means they need to incorporate into existing systems so that they can see results. And then this, we need to eliminate any survey biases and encourage student honesty. A good student, or a good surveys are hard to come by and they're usually quite expensive. However, we believe this will be conducive to uh, enabling student attention and give an accurate representation of what's occurring here at LV University. Okay, so we said that our pitch is about retention and persistence. Well, what is the current state of retention at LV University? So using data from ITS, we have along the y-axis, we have the ratio of students lost. Along the x-axis, we have each class here. So using this, we get time series data and we can see a mild but identifiable trend. For instance, in 2015, term one to term two losses were at 12%. By 2019, it was up to 17%. In 2015, term one to term three losses were 24%. By 2019, they were up to 33%. Let me explain that figure a little bit. That means that in fall of 2019, your first year students showed up. By fall of 2020, 33% of those students had left the university. Now I said this data was from ITS. ITS takes a lot of data on students before they come to the university. And they put together a machine learning model that can predict with 93% accuracy based off of 26 key demographics, whether or not a student will retain. But the question is, how do we use this tool? Is it ethical to use this tool? What if we use this tool to drive recruitment and we only recruited students who we predicted were likely to retain? Now keep in mind that many of these demographics are things like ethnicity, race, gender, financial aid status. But we don't think that's particularly ethical. In fact, we think the best way to use this data is to identify students who may be in need and providing them with the resources they need to succeed at Alpha University. A focus on university enhancement rather than a focus on retention or recruitment. <clears throat> Uh, Alfred does have one piece of data it takes while students are at the university, but doesn't take it on the students. Rather, it's something called a four week measure, where, like the name says, at the first four weeks of an Alfred University student, their professors in each of their classes individually says how well they're doing and predicts how well they'll be doing at the end of the semester. This is a solely academic model, so it doesn't really allow us to tell, it doesn't tell us what students need, are facing outside the classroom, and it's not student facing. In fact, students don't even know about it. The vast majority of students don't know uh, that the four week measure exists and thinks they're just left in the air after they get the job. And as Sam said, it's not student facing. So uh, this graph shows uh, the semesters completed here at Alfred University on the x axis and the percentage of students reasoning for why they're leaving. And a lot, of, in all cases, it's unknown for the majority of the case or for the majority of semesters. And uh, Academic reasoning is the second reason. So it's really, we really need to focus in on why students are leaving in this unknown category because this is such a huge percentage of students. And you can see from this graph that in the first year at Alfred, the first two semesters, that a lot of students are leaving for unknown reasons. Okay, so what other data do we have? We have exit interview data the university has conducted and collected over the last couple of years. The problem that the university faces is with their response rate. A lot of students that leave the university aren't filling out the survey. So we do have a lack of data points. In addition to that, as you can see, the number one is financial concerns. What does that mean? What, what were the financial concerns? What was the number one reason financially that students decided that they need to leave the university? In addition to that, this data has reverse survivor bias, which means that it's only showing the students that have already decided to leave, right? They're already gone. This does not show the students that are struggling semester, you know, barely persisting through and maybe one challenge away from saying, you know what, I'm done. I'm ready to leave the university. This data doesn't show it. In addition to that, it's aggregated. You can't call out an individual student with this data. We can't see that um, Sarah from the brick is having financial issues. Her parents just lost her job. They can't make payments right for the next couple months. She also has a roommate that just got a boyfriend that she keeps having over, making it tough for her to study, which now she's struggling academically, right? So what's our pitch? The first part, we want to propose having a regular student survey for all undergraduate students, not just the first and second year students. We want this survey to be about quality of life, about their well-being, about their financials, and about their academics as well. We wanted to fully encompass the total uh, university experience. In addition to that, we want to make it known to the, these students that it is 
confidential and that the survey is set by default to be anonymous. When the students fill out the survey, there's a box at the top of the survey that they can check to make it not anonymous. That's still be confidential, just not anonymous. And what this would do is, for instance, we'll bring back Sarah. She's struggling with finances with her parents, a roommate, and now she's struggling in her academics. When she fills out the survey and she lists out all those struggles, if she checks the box that says it's not anonymous, it's so uh, it's because she wants the correct department to hear about her issues. She wants financial aid to get a beacon alert that Sarah from the brick is having issues financially, and that she wants someone to reach out to work with her about maybe a, a payment system that'll work better for her and her parents. She wants ResLite to reach out to maybe do roommate mediation to, to figure out better uh, situation with her roommate and her new boyfriend. They maybe reach out from CAS to figure out how they can work with the professors to maybe get extensions on assignments or set up a different um, tutoring service. And lastly, we believe that this, this survey needs to be given at least once a semester. We all know, you all know that a lot can happen in a 30 week period throughout an entire year. A lot can happen in 15 weeks in just one semester. Life is consistently changing. So we believe that this survey at least needs to be once a semester just to check in with the students and see where they're struggling the most. Uh, additionally, while we want the surveys to be given to all classmates, the fact of the matter is that first and secondary students are our focus for a couple key important reasons. First of all, the majority of the losses are here. So it makes sense for us to divert most of our resources to where most of the problem is. Second of all, first and second year students only see Alfred in those first and second years, which means when we ask them the problem, they're relevant problems that are happening right now, rather than upperclassmen who might have problems with Alfred because of stuff that happened in the past that we are already working on. Additionally, because they're new, that means if we do the changes that the first and second year students complain about, when there are new first and second year students that we're focusing on, they will see the changes and they will see the new Alfred and we will constantly be capable of making relevant changes to the student life on campus. And in the first and second years, connections to Alfred University is important to keep students here. And one of the things that uh, St. Bonaventure does, my sister goes there, and every semester they have a uh, survey that they conduct. And to do the survey, or to get the incentive at the end, which is usually a dollar, which can go back into a prize pool, is that you have to complete a survey uh, aimed towards the students. So what they want to see in the next semester, what they want to see in the next year, what could, what could St. Bonaventure improve about themselves so that they can cater to the students itself. So we believe that this is one of the key aspects that needs to happen for these surveys. And it could be swag, it could be a dollar cash prize again, but something to incentivize them to be truthful and honest with these surveys. And in this, because it's student facing in the four week measure now, that the students will want to complete this, they want to know, or they want to improve their residence life, they want to improve their food, they want to improve their life here at home. And this needs to be on a third party platform, we believe, so the students trust it and that it won't negatively affect themselves in their classes or with their roommates or with anything else. And we, this needs to be a proactive approach so that we can retain students here at Alfred. Okay, so honestly, three of us here, we are graduate students in the MBA program. We're very lucky to have one in the class with us as well. And we've noticed that a lot of times at Alfred University, there's a really good idea and there's a bit of a shortfall when it comes to execution. So a big part of our pitch is that we're going to create a cross-functional operations leadership team that's going to be directly responsible for action. So this team is going to have somebody with a data background, somebody with a marketing background, somebody in student affairs, maybe somebody in sociology. And additionally, this team will be empowered to take that action. I just said this was a cross-functional team. We're talking about lots of different departments. This team needs to be able to take action without needing consent from each individual chain of command. So the action that this team will be doing, what will they be responsible for? is developing this survey, distributing this survey along with the incentives, connecting students to the resources that they need based on the results of the survey, analyzing the overall data, and making other recommendations based on it. So what's the return on investment? So the first aspect of this is knowing what we don't know or gaining that knowledge. Because we have a huge percentage of our students who are leaving for unknown reasons, we need to understand why and can reach out to those students so that they can feel welcome here at Alfred. Additionally, a uh, benefit of this beyond just retention is that this is an amazing supportive tool for all other initiatives on Alfred. A lot of different people are coming with a lot of different ways to improve the school and they're wonderful ideas and they do great things, but a lot of them falter because again, we 
don't know how to execute them because we don't have the data. This tool isn't just going to be reserved for uh, retention. It's going to be reserved for any aspect of the university that can use data on student life to improve itself. So in addition to that great support aspect that Sam mentioned, there's also an internal benefit to this initiative, and that is in the proactive approach that Noah hit on a little bit earlier. Now, in 2019, a consulting team came for Alfred, and in their report, they mentioned that Alfred has a lot of great resources for students. There's a real problem where it's very difficult for students to access these resources. So our initiative helps connect students who are in need with resources that are already on campus. And every time we can make that connection, we can have a student retained who otherwise would not have retained. It is a benefit to the university. And based off of university estimates for the value of adding one student to a program, we estimate this benefit to be $10,000. Every time that we connect a student to the resources they need, it helps them retain that as a $10,000 benefit to the university. We all know that admissions spends a great deal of effort every year on enrollment, on selecting the students and getting the classes filled. One of the benefits would be reducing the um, burden on enrollment for every student that we can retain, we can save from leaving to go to another college, is one less student that admissions has to enroll in the following fall semester. This also opens up doors and possibilities of university where they can potentially be more selective with their future candidates. Okay, so those are all great benefits. But what does it cost to the university to do this? Well, first, we all have startup costs. We need to create a new four week or at least improve the old one such that it is capable of communicating with students, that students can put in their feedback, and also the departments that aren't just academic can comment on students' performance so we can get a better gauge of how they're surviving. We also need to create new surveys because four week is only four week. We need it at least one semester for every single year. Uh, so we need to make new surveys. So that's the cost. And then lastly, we mentioned for beacon alerts, these are alerts that allow uh, departments to basically say a warning sign to other departments about like what is going on with a student and what they need help with. We need to merge those with the system such that if we have data that says a student is hurting financially, we have data that says a student is hurting academically in red life, that those departments immediately get notified so that the students can get the help they need when they need it. So those are our startup costs. What does this initiative cost to run yearly? Well, this needs to be on a third party platform, as we mentioned earlier, and we estimate that cost to be about $1,000 a year. But the biggest cost is this cross-functional operations leadership team. Now, our team spoke with Nadine Shardlow, the director for the Center of Academic Success. Now, she has experience putting together similar operations leadership teams, operating at a similar size and with a similar scope. And in speaking with her, we estimate the cost of putting together our cross-functional team to be $100,000 a year. Do we have any questions? I'm trying to get my arms around when you do the survey and you identify some issues that students have. Um, there's going to be short term issues, you know, and then medium, and then the longer ones, like they don't like the dorm room. <laughs> so, you know, you can't fix that overnight. Mm -hmm. So, how are you going to approach this? You have your cross functional team, which would be students. Uh, students could definitely be on the team, but right now it'd be, it'd be staff, it'd be faculty, staff, staff, faculty. Okay, and um, you sure they have the time also? Of course, that's it. Chatted with all of them. Yeah. <laughs> I know how busy so this stuff doesn't be. happen immediately. We, we understand that. Of yeah, course. okay. I mean, and speaking with, speaking with uh, advisors to us, we yeah. recognize that. Yeah. You really get their input on putting together similar teams. So. Answer your question about long term and short term. Short term usually has resources already on campus that we can provide them for. Long term, it would be a systemic change we make to Alfred. So maybe we can't help that student directly, but if their short term problems are lessened, long term problems uh, will feel easier, and then new students will not need to see those long term problems. And I think that a key element here is that we just need to identify these problems. Because right now we, we can't identify the problems because we don't have data on it. Right. The majority of our bits is, is identifying these problems so we can even begin to consider how we're going to fix them. Because right now we can't consider how we're going to fix problems if we don't know what the problems are. We don't know what they are. Yeah. Excellent presentation. Um, okay, I'm going to tie up three quick questions. One, because you had me incredibly intrigued, why is it difficult to access resources and what resources? Sure, absolutely. So why is it difficult to access resources? Well, for instance, the, the Bursar's office, financial aid, they all have forms that do the exact same thing, but they're at different offices. We've all had experience at Alfred where we fill out a form, we go to an office, they say, no, 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 you need to go to that office over there. And we go to that office over there, and they say, no, 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 
you need to go to that office over there. And this is all paper. This is all you have to go in person. That's especially difficult during COVID. This isn't online. This isn't directed, and nothing's integrated. And this was this is part of the issues that were identified in that 2019 consultant, of course, well. And just from our own experience, we know that it's sometimes it's difficult to access these resources just because we get bounced around between systems and there's five different paper forms that all do the same thing, but they only take one of them. Okay, so great point. And and I will actually say that I experienced one of those very issues <laughs> today. So I see that has not changed. Um okay, lastly. I really like the beacon alert. Here's my question, and I say this as somebody coming from Rochester, New York, where because of a lot of um, mental illness calls with police, there's been a, a renewed um, call for more mental health professionals, right? Unfortunately, there's such great demand and so few resources that you shoot yourself in the foot. So. You have these beacon alerts set up. You have a proliferation of data and of calls for assistance, you know, varying calls for assistance. How are you going to prevent a bottleneck so that you can actually deploy the resources, particularly with regard to staffing, to meet the needs of students that they don't then become pissed off, for lack of a better word, <laughs> that they've opened themselves up to you anonymously or otherwise, and you drop the ball. So prioritization is, is obviously very important. I think that that data is going to sort of show what needs to be prioritized. And that's, again, because we don't have that data in front of us because it doesn't exist. But if we are able to have that team together, I think that in that data, prioritization is going to be important. And maybe that team can consult outside of it. They can consult with the professors. They can consult with the students on what issues we want to prioritize. And if we are facing a, a bottleneck where there is genuine need and there isn't genuinely enough resources, well, then that's a sign that we need to increase the resources. And mental health resources on campus are a great example of that. I know that that issue has come up with people I've interacted with as well. But if we have data that says we need more mental health counseling on campus, and we can say, hey, look, if we have all this data, all these students, and every single one of them, or a significant portion of them, are saying, I need mental health counseling, well, maybe we can increase those resources. Maybe we can justify increasing those resources with that data. Does 100K exclude staffing? It does not. So it includes staffing? I mean, for well, with regard to beacon alerts. Uh, with regard to beacon, not, with, not with regard to beacon alerts. That's just for the team. The beacon alerts. Okay. So yeah. the beacon alerts are already coming that the university has implemented. What we are suggesting is that we merge the beacon alerts with our proposal such that it's not just a spontaneous thing when you notice there's a problem with the student, but if we see through the survey that there's a problem with the student, we can, we basically, there's already a resource on campus that allows us to direct them to what they need. And we just want to use that rather than making a new system. Yeah, I think it, I think it's just a great start to get this data collected. I'm a, I'm a resident director currently for Brick and Cruisin, and so you made the point about mental health, right? And that's a lot of stuff that I experienced throughout this year with students, especially with COVID and being in your dorm room for a long period of time, right? And some some cases when there's a you know a mental health uh, emergency. That's quick and short term, but a lot of the cases are long terms. Um, and I, I find that students come to me asking me um, and telling me about their mental health issues, and there's no way they, they're just not they're not directed in the right in the right direction. You tell them to go to the wellness center, but they're booked out, and they point them in the other direction. We'll go to Res Life because it's not really a mental health thing; it's more a Res Life thing. And so having the survey, collecting this data, and seeing where what are the most what are the largest mental health concerns. And then where do we need to build the support systems, maybe in the wellness center and in res life to help those students? Um, I think it's huge. We just, we don't know. Yeah, on that front, like, and also about the bureaucracy of it, I've needed to help underclassmen consistently communicate their problems, which are genuine problems and have solutions. But it's such a burden to know how to phrase emails of the RD, to know where to go, to know what to do. And the only reason why I do that is because I've been that experience before, which means that if a first year who hasn't been that experience is experiencing it, they are likely to not know how to get to that resolution. That problem's never gonna resolve, and it's gonna fester like a wound until the next problem comes up and they realize Alfred University did not have my back during that. Why am I still going here? And inhibiting that first like disdain for the university because their problems aren't being solved is key to keeping these students in the problem. And 
Uh, one last point that I'll make about that. As a director, I, I, as a resident director, I never realized how common it is for students to literally pack their stuff and leave the campus without even saying a word. They have issues with the campus and they don't even, maybe they try and find people to consult with to get fixes, but they can't, they can't find it. And they literally just pack the belongings in U-Haul and leave. And it isn't until two, three, four weeks from now do we find that the student hasn't been on campus. That's a problem, right? We, we need to have a survey. We need to have a platform readily available and known, especially to freshmen students, which are the buildings that I look over, that if they, if, if, if everything comes to get falls apart, they can go on line, maybe potentially, and they can click on the survey or they can, they can fill it out. And like I mentioned before, and not make it anonymous and say, listen, I'm having these issues and I'm about to leave. I need, I need, I need financial aid help. I need res life help and I need academic help. I need all of it. Um, and students just don't have that, that platform right now. They don't have any sort of survey or any document really fill out. They can go personally to visit these different departments. Um, but a lot of these freshmen don't even know where these departments are located, which that's a whole other issue. But. Are you talking about a, a rolling open survey or a once per semester survey? Because a once per semester wouldn't catch. Yeah, that and I, I blurred into the into uh, uh, open survey. It would be a one time semester survey, but it could open up to being a. Well, so the main structure is something that every student would do would be once a semester. There'd be the four week measure for first and second year students that would happen at four weeks. And that might be a slightly different survey catered specifically to their needs. And then because this platform exists, it is sort of a platform to ask for help. Well, maybe without even a specific survey, but a platform where you can ask for help. The other element is that the survey will familiarize the students with the departments that they don't know. So they would be able to see that. So once they, the students are paying the four week measure, then through that platform, it would be like, do you like it? We, they would know to go to Res Life or to go to academic aid so that when problems happen later in the year, they know what to go. Or ideally, even with the four week measure, we address these problems before they start. Have you started drafting the survey? We have not. <laughs> we can. <laughs> <laughs> Time for one last question. Let's see if Brian has one. <laughs> Is there um, a mentoring, a mentorship program? There used to be. On campus uh, in our, for first year students, especially. The honors program has a, a big brother, big sister program, but other than that, I'm not aware of any. Have classes for the freshmen to get mentoring, but not from like another student, other than the teacher aid that's there. There are programs that they're fragmented. Yeah, yeah. HOP yeah. has a mentorship program, but as you know, it's a small program. Basically, every kind of student but your average student can probably find a way to mentorship. And if you want students to fill out a survey, um, give them food. And <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> Always. A great incentive, isn't it? Alumni. Yeah. Yeah. So, Carl, you're an MBA student? Yes, that's correct. Noah? Yes, I am an MBA. Yep. Your name was, I'm sorry? Ian. Ian, you're an MBA student as well? Correct. And um, Sam? Sam Well, uh, I am actually a political science student. Hey. I'm sorry? I'm a political science student. And what year are you? I'm a junior. We're all uh, mechanical engineers as well. <laughs> <laughs> that was our undergrad. Oh, yeah. yeah, our undergrad is all mechanical engineering. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> We've been here a long time. Yeah. <laughs> all right, great. Well, thank you so yeah, much. Great. Yeah, thank you very much. This is an issue our board has talked about many times. <laughs> many times. Many times. Thank you. Hey, yes. <laughs> I said uh, share a huge retention. I did. I what about that? Okay. Thanks everybody for tuning in today. We really appreciate it. Um we're gonna be taking a vote for the People's Choice Award um for your favorite. Um I Yes, we're doing that via the chat. Dan, do you know the vehicle for said voting? I did not know. Okay. Um, you can either put your vote in the chat if you're comfortable doing that, or you can email me, um, gaustad, G-A-U-S-T-A-D, at alfred.edu, and I will also be happy to compile the People's Choice votes.
Um, but you have about two or three minutes because we're going to stop the stream uh, for our deliberations. And Brian, we're going to give you a call. <laughs> and Dan will collect the votes and pass them on to the judges. Yeah, I'm hoping it comes through. Uh, if you it has them sending uh, her email. Also. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Was it a sneeze? Oh. <laughs> Sometimes you can't tell it. <laughs> yeah, right. We got the mask on. <clears throat> All right, one more minute for chat voting. Otherwise, you'll have to uh, email me. Thank you all for participating as judges. Thank you. Good. So you got a sense uh, they span all four years, yeah. all academic units, and even a few MBA students thrown in uh, yeah. at the graduate level. Yeah. I went to college with Carl. Really? <laughs> Slightly right. diversity. Yes. What's his last name? I'm um, just finished something. Get out of here. No, no, Carl my house. I'm getting, no, 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 because if I do, um, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so, what's going on? I just like to pause this real quick and then open up that second question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maurice just sent me a message. Uh, so, she can leave the chat open. Right? Oh, okay, that's perfect. So, right. we can keep those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's great. Yeah, he's a Brian, we're cool. gonna we're gonna call you on a separate Zoom. Oh, no, that's or share a Zoom with you shortly. Yeah, I, I believe uh, we just sent the link already. We're gonna end this one. Okay, let me just grab a piece of paper though to write down these votes. <laughs> In Corning, I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah, so you can. Yeah. Okay. New York, but no. And lunch should be here shortly. Okay. okay. Paul actually. I've seen ideas. it in the last couple of years. I like to build it yeah, right randomly at the Calgary Park. People still hear us that are chat or. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 Uh, no, my question. We cut off the chat, right? This is like delusional. Yeah. In a second. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, I was like, oh, um, sounds familiar. You were. I heard a quick second. Yeah. I'm just going to write these down. Uh, that's too funny. That's funny, isn't it? I never think of myself in that category, but now with Louisville going to college. And I was late to the game. Okay. I was late to the game. Oh, oh my goodness. Boy, it's not ringing tracks. There's a, yeah, no, there's a uh, uh, Alfred alumni who was an exec at Corning, and I, his name was Lou Mancito. So I said, oh, you want to challenge Charlie? Okay, guys, we're going to be turning it off. So if you didn't get a chance to drop, um, drop your vote in the chat, feel, still feel free to email me. Um, the YouTube chat will stay open for just a couple more minutes for, for voting there if you prefer as well. And we will have a big announcement about the winners uh, shortly, uh, early afternoon.